Welcome to The Dump Station, a podcast from RV Enthusiast. To RV Enthusiast, you are in, uh, you're from California? Yeah, Northern California, just, just above the uh, Sacramento area. Uh-huh. And it's so you're an RVer and you're staying with yeah. Sue there in uh, Tennessee? Yes, just came out to uh, visit with Dan and Sue out here in Tennessee and uh, been a long time RVer and uh, enjoy it. I just saw your uh, first magazine that came out and I was impressed with it. Fantastic. Thank you. So uh, I understand from Sue, you've got a question for us. Yeah, I I see a lot of stuff on Facebook. I'm on a bunch of the different RV sites there. And and one of the big questions that seems to come up is batteries, uh, 12 volt versus six volt and um, amp hours and, and that for them. The other question I see that come up a lot are the failure of heating systems with sail switches. And a lot of people don't know what a sail switch is or how to replace one. And, you know, if a video or something like that could be brought up to the magazine or, or something that would be, mm-hmm. that's a good one. I think it'd be a big benefit to you. Yeah, that, that's definitely a good question. Anybody? Well, we have, uh, we were, we got a story on batteries in the uh, April issue coming up. Okay. And it pretty much describes the differences in the, in the different types of batteries and, uh, the question is is an ongoing question. You know, do I want 12s or do I want sixes? And you know, I mean, for the most part, most people are going to tell you the sixes are the better way to go. But uh, yeah, we have that coming up, and we're going to be covering that over over the next few months too, because uh, it is a big question. And uh, and battery technology is changing, and so so there's so many more you know uh, details and so much more so many more products out there to talk about. And uh, and, and as people become a lot more reliant on, on batteries as they start gravitating to the primitive lifestyle. And I don't mean primitive in that, in that <laughs> respect. I'm talking about boondocking. <laughs> right, right. We're anything but primitive. You know, like we're it's a luxury, it's a luxury lifestyle in a in a primitive environment. How's that? There you go. Yeah. Absolutely. And then when you talk about sales switches, of course, that that is a concern in it. It's it's fascinating because my uh, uh, my brother sister and brother in law are out on the road, and uh, they have uh, Tom has had to replace sail switches in two RVs twice uh, since he's been out there. So sail switch is in a standard air uh, propane fired air furnace, and what the sail switch does is it detects that the uh, the squirrel cage fan is turning at the proper uh, RPMs and that it's uh, actually putting out enough air to uh, circulate around the blower, not only to provide enough uh, to provide air heat, uh, heated air into the unit, but also to make sure that the uh, furnace doesn't overheat. Because if you don't have airflow around that, uh, you can overheat the furnace pretty quickly. And the switch is just a little spring-loaded uh, flapper switch with a, uh, a little aluminum tab that comes off of it. And uh, it's, uh, uh, it's just a little micro switch. So when the air hits it, it clicks it on and it completes the circuit. Uh, so it tells the uh, circuit board, hey, you know what? You've got enough airflow and it's one of the safety devices within the furnace. There's an overheat switch and there's that and uh, a couple of other things that make sure that both uh, uh, magnetic electromagnetic valves are open for the uh, gas flow and and it has a heat uh, flame to sense and a bunch of other things. So uh, those switches though, uh, the they're, I I don't know where they're made, but they do have an issue where sometimes it can click the switch, but it doesn't make the contact inside. And so that's where people are sort of having problems with those. And uh, they've on the newer generation uh, furnaces, they've actually made them easier to replace. So in the old days, you had, used to have to take the whole squirrel cage apart mm-hmm. uh, to get into it. It was screwed from the inside. And now uh, you can actually get to it a little bit more easily uh, to, to replace it. So um, being that they fail the way they do, it pro- you know, they're not overly expensive. It's probably not a bad idea to have one in your toolkit. If you are uh, RVing in particularly cold climates where you're really depending on that furnace to keep you and your RV warm and keep your pipes above freezing. Um, but uh, if you're in a more mild climate, there's, uh, you know, you may not need one as, as quickly. Probably a good idea to learn how to or know what's involved in replacing it before you need to, right, Chris? 
It does, and it depends on the model of furnace. So if you have, uh, you know, one of the more legacy models, uh, you're going to have to take the screws off. You'll take the, uh, there's a, uh, in some of the even older ones, there's a, a, a electrical component, a, a switch on the top that you've got to take pop, pop off, and then you're going to pull the whole thing out from the outside. Now there's uh, other types of furnaces that the entire furnace is actually encased in the RV, and all you have is the vent on the outside. And that makes it a lot more difficult to uh, replace. You actually have to pull the furnace out from inside the RV. Uh, and that can be... Uh, that could be a nightmare. That can be... <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, you have to move uh, ducting and wiring and plumbing and take empty your, you know, fifth wheels. You have to empty the whole front compartment, take the wall down, you know, to get into it. So um, it just depends on the model of furnace that you've got. One other question I had was the... Uh... I'm starting to see fiberglass propane tanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, forget it because no one will fill them anymore. No one will fill them anymore. I don't know about the other states, but in California, it's gone. I have one of those things. They're made in Europe. And uh, is it Sweden where they're made? I can't remember. But uh, nobody will fill them anymore. And I've taken to three or four different places and they say it's no longer certified for filling. And I go, (laughs) Well, wait a minute. This has got all the certifications stamped right on the right on the uh, the, the valve guard up there, and they go, "Too bad, uh, we're not going to fill them anymore." And nobody will do it. Even the people who don't pay attention to age will not do it. And uh, you're supposed to pay attention to when these things time out. And so they won't even they won't even touch it. And it's it, it's interesting with those because we used to use fiberglass wrapped uh, air cylinders in the fire service. So, uh, you know, many years ago, they, they, for compressed air, they converted over uh, to that and it's a much lighter cylinder. Uh, But uh, again, there's a a lifespan uh, to that. And even with steel propane cylinders, you're supposed to be able to get them recertified after a time. Well, what I found out here is, and I I have an older truck camper that's been a project of mine. Uh, when I bought it and the cylinders were were super expired and I wanted to get them recertified and they look like brand new, I can't get anybody in the entire New England region to recertify propane tanks. Any of the big gas companies, the propane companies, whatever, they say they don't do it anymore. So I've had to, you know, order new cylinders and replace them and it's a liability thing or whatever else. So when you get right down to it, it's probably better just to replace them once they get out of date. Yeah, no doubt about it. I think the cost involved in it is cheaper to buy a new one. Right. Yeah, I mean, they're pretty reasonable now. You know, it's yeah. not, you're talking, not generally talking hundreds of dollars a cylinder the way it used yeah. to be. 